closely with Cancer Survivors Park. And prior to COVID, we held many of our programs such as yoga, Pilates, and um, uh, many of our support groups at the Center for Hope and Healing at the park. If you haven't yet been to Cancer Survivors Park, now is a beautiful time of year to check it out. Um, it's located in between Cleveland Park and Falls Park downtown, and it's designed to serve as a gathering space for multiple organizations to share their messages of health and healing, such as what we will be doing tonight. Uh, the, if, as I said, it's located in, in between the Falls Park and Cleveland Park, and there's a parking lot for easy access at, at 24 Cleveland Street. Tonight, we are tuning in from the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorships, excuse me, with nurse practitioners, Pam Coys and Gina Franco. Gina and Pam will weigh in on common misconceptions about diet, exercise, and wellness. The two will provide recommendations based off of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine standards, along with best methods and tips drawn from personal experiences. This will be a fireside chat Q&A style discussion, so please join us in conversation as we encourage questions and comments in the chat box. And I will be sure to read aloud those questions as Gina and Pam will provide best answers at the end. And with that, Gina and Pam, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to do our introductions first. So hello, everyone. Thank you for, for sharing some time with us on this beautiful evening. I guess I'll begin uh, with my introductions. I'm Gina Franco. I am a nurse practitioner and director of the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship at the Cancer Institute. And uh, I've been a nurse practitioner my whole, pretty much my whole adult life. And I am here to talk to you um, about some nutrition pieces. And the reason why we thought this was good is because I've pretty much struggled with nutrition most of my life. Uh, I really was not that athletic as a young adult. I became more athletic uh, in my 30s and onward. And I've had my share of health issues along the way. I had early stage breast cancer, some other issues with a brain bleed. So just different things that just kind of interrupted your, your road that you don't always know are going to happen. And then we decided to really start to look, investigate more uh, how to become more uh, certified in uh, lifestyle medicine. And so we, the Academy for Lifestyle Medicine is a way to certify as nurse practitioners and, and physicians. And that was a two year uh, study period for most of us. And I uh, passed my exam in 2020. I've learned a lot through that. And interestingly through that, I am now about 85, 90% uh, uh, plant-based and really went unwillingly until I saw the science and really studied things for the first two years. Thank you, Gina. Um, I'm Pam Cloys. I'm uh, one of the nurse practitioners in the Cancer Institute and uh, work at the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship for the last four years. Um, I've been with the Cancer Institute 15 years and worked in various different areas and uh, decided that finally, as I'm get ready to retire. This is where I needed to be to finish out my um, career. I've been a nurse practitioner since 2003 um, and I've done primary care as well as oncology. Um, I also, I've been an exerciser my entire life, but basically just ate whatever I wanted. And when you're younger, that doesn't really play a part in your life. But as you get older, it definitely has impacts. And I, as, as Gina um, stated, had, had some health problems. Um, I had a heart attack in, when I was 50 um, because I was overweight and I ate wrong and I have a huge family history. Um, but it took me, it's taken me 10 years to really hone in on that. It's not an easy thing to do to change your life lifestyle, I should say. And um, my journey, I think, really began when I started studying for the, um, the certification exam for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, because you're so entrenched in um, nutrition and exercise lifestyle changes that you just start, as Gina said, seeing the science and you want to do that for your health and for your future. Um, and I think it's been a really good journey for me and I'm still journeying in the best way I can. So I'm excited to talk to you about 
um, exercise. I exercise well. And I also teach exercise here at the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship. And I do um, assessments for, patient, for our patients that want to participate in our programs. Um, and with that, we are going to start talking about diet and nutrition. <clears throat> so Gina, <coughs> our first question is about sweeteners, um, artificial sweeteners, or those specifically plant-derived like stevia or monk sweetener, is there an advantage to using one versus the other? And how does sugar compare to these newer sweeteners that we're seeing? So the, the technical terms <coughs> for these are non-nutritional and are natural. And um, they're, they're natural, so even plant-derived. But uh, really, do, are they really helping us in our diet? <laughs> Just to give you a perspective, Monk sweetener is about 250 times sweeter than sugar. Well, there was a study in 2017 in the International Journal of Obesity, and they looked at, at people both um, ingesting sugar versus uh, equal or aspartame, stevia, and uh, monk fruit. And so they, but they measured their blood sugars over 24 hours. So if they drank their product, whatever it was, the stevia or the, the, um, the sugar product, and then they measured their blood sugar after that, but then they also measured other blood sugars at other intervals. So the, the person that had, I think it was a can of soda, which had 16 teaspoons of sugar in it, just noting 16 teaspoons, um, their, uh, their blood sugar went up accordingly. But then what they noticed is the people that had the non-nutritive sweeteners, their sugars were up higher the rest of the day. And so they um, surmised by this is that possibly people are eating more, or possibly the, the non-nutritive sweeteners stimulate you to eat more um, because you, you just, your, your sweetness might be held because they are so much sweeter than the sugar. In any event, um, no matter which reason or another reason that we don't even know, they don't really help you. So they don't help you consume less calories in a day, sadly enough. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And next question is how much protein do we need in our diet? Some have advocated a higher protein diet and low carb to make it easier for a, a person to lose weight. Yeah, I mean, we are just addicted to protein in this country, no matter what the diet du jour is, the diet of the, of the decade. And whether it's in, in supplements or whether it's in shakes or whether it's just high protein foods. So there's always a diet every decade. So it's the zone, there's mm -hmm. a star seal diet. I just, I just found that, I forgot mm -hmm. about that one. Um, and then there's the Atkins diet, we have paleo diets. So we have all of them. Uh, but are they really helping us? So protein is a macronutrient. It's the three macronutrients, fat, carbs, and protein. So we know we need them. We need, need them for essential functions. We need them for tissue repair. Uh, but do we need, is more better is really the question. So you need protein to preserve muscle mass. And just to note, since we are kind of now over, oh, I'm over six, you know, six years. I am. We are, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think um, I'm kind of about six months older than you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you need put, you lose 5% of skeletal muscle each decade of your life. And yeah, that's if you didn't do anything, you're going to lose muscle. And you really need protein to preserve your muscle mass. Plus, you don't, you don't um, absorb your proteins as well. So you need a little more protein over 60. But that being said, how do you, it's really confusing sometimes to look at how much protein do you need. So the easiest way I can do it is to convert your weight to kilograms. So I am 150 pounds, and that's about 68 kilograms. 2.2 um, pounds equals one kilogram. So you need, if you weren't doing any exercise, you need about 0 0.8 to one, one um, gram of protein per kilogram of your weight. And that's if you're younger than 60. Um, so if I was younger than 60, I would need about uh, uh, 68 milligrams of, um, about, about 54 to 68 grams of protein. But if you're exercising and if you're training, so if you're training for a marathon and you're training for a, a you know, longer bike race, that changes everything. And then you need to go up to the 1.2 to 1.7 grams of protein. So then in comparison to the 50 to 68 grams of protein, you would need more like a 60 to 80 grams of protein. Okay. And then again, if you're over 60, you got to go up to that 1.2. So if I'm 68 kilograms, it's going to be um, more like um, 68 kilograms up to the 80, up to the um, 81 grams of protein. Interesting. Now, how um, how would the average person 
monitor the uh, protein in their diet. Yeah, so it gets confusing. Yeah, yeah. So it should your protein should be about ten to thirty five percent of your diet. So you can kind of use that as a rule of thumb. But then the other thing is, there's so many apps now to mm -hmm. kind of train you to figure it out. So I use my fitness pal. I've used it for a while. There's a free version. There's a premium version. There's also Noom. You also can just get a protein. You can get a, a macronutrient book. But you can really start to figure out what it is that you're eating. And um, the myth, of course, is that if you're plant-based, you're not going to get enough protein, which is simply not true because number one, we don't need as much protein as we think we need. And then also, like just for an example, soy milk is eight grams per cup and tofu or soybeans, that three and a half ounce serving have about 10 to 19 grams of protein. That's right. And then what do you think about the use of like protein bars as a supplement? Well, again, being plant-based, the mm -hmm. whole thing is to not use as much processed mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. But if a plant, if a bar, assuming it doesn't have too many fat grams, is going to be better than going to a fast food restaurant and it's, you know, after you exercise or if it's to supplement a meal, then that's that's okay. We, we shouldn't have all processed plant foods, but sometimes you just have to have some. Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. That's important information. Now tell us, what is the difference between a high protein diet and a keto diet? Because yes. keto is all the rage now for yes. all kinds of prevention of um, chronic disease. Yeah. So um, help us understand that a little bit better. I still look at this one, how it very would get. So the keto diet or the ketogenic diet is basically um, going way down in your carbohydrates, less than 50 grams, and then you're eating higher protein because what you're trying to do is put your body in a state of ketosis. Ketosis is when you're using your fat to burn your energy, which really sounds cool, except that it doesn't really do well over time. So people are successful at it uh, a short period of time, but when they've done long-term studies, they really are not as healthy at all. I mean, some of this data is pretty scary to think about or, or even see. And the other thing is people gain their weight back when they go off the diet mm -hmm. because it's not a sustainable plan. You can't stay on the keto forever. It's just not, a, a there's not enough foods and people just don't seem to do that. Uh, and any fad diet is not sustainable, yeah, really. That's absolutely. the whole thing. So basically the total restriction that people often regain their weight. And then the other thing is they lose lean muscle mass as they, and it's what we call sarcopenia. So when they're losing the lean muscle mass, when they're chronically on that keto diet or even you know, a period of several months, when their basal metabolic rate goes down because your basal metabolic rate is just really the amount of calories that you need in a 24 hour period for your, your body. And if you have less protein as a part of your body composition and more fat, which is really what ends up happening, um, you don't need as many calories per day. So another reason they regain weight. Then lastly, just if you weren't convinced by all that, there was the European St Society of Cardiology Congress did a 25,000 study, which would be really hard, I would think, in Munich. And they looked at low carb diets as the high and and they had the highest rate risk of dying from cancer, cardiovascular conditions, and all others. And then there's also a, a Lancet article that basically said that people who followed these diets that were low in carbs and high in animal proteins, typical of the keto diet, had a higher risk of early death compared to those who consumed carbs in moderation. So, I mean, it's just chronically, it's just not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, <clears throat> tell us what the... Um... And I'm adding in more questions and I'm sorry because I'm thinking about. It. So tell us what the American College of Lifestyle Medicine um, recommend for the reduction or stabilization of chronic disease. Well, it's it's basically to follow a plant-based diet right, and right. then to do physical exercise, which we're going to, to um, talk about. But the biggest thing is that you can't you can't eat your you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. That's correct. so um, you know, and often we get people that are really overweight and it's like, well, what do they do first? The exercise or the, or the weight mm -hmm. reduction. And, and as you know, we often focus on really working on the nutrition and the weight reduction because it's just, it's very, very hard to do all of this at once. It is, I agree with that. And um, as the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is, uh, has its name, these uh, things that we're talking about today are not fad diets or fad exercises. These are lifestyle choices that you make 
so that you can live your life more healthy and reap the benefits of decreasing your risk of chronic disease, which is a little bit more Im important. And, uh, and then you wouldn't see the yo-yo uh, weight loss, weight gain um, if you followed you know, uh, a, a more a, a diet that you do slowly over time to change into the way you want to live for the rest of your life. So I think it's very important to have this conversation, especially it is, this is a prevention series. And we, um, our whole goal in our, uh, one of our goals in the um, CIOS is to promote healthier lifestyle choices for our cancer patients um, so that they uh, minimize their cancer risk. It's interesting because four of us now are taking the, the mm. ACL on board. And all four of us, I think I can include, we have migrated to being much more plant based. And I, I don't think any of us really forced, could no. actually see that we were going in that direction. No, we just, we just changed the way we lived and we changed it slowly. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, to talk sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, the next question I have is what is all the hype about fiber? Yeah. Um, well, the big thing why it's really gaining attention is although we love protein in this country, we don't seem to love fiber. About 75% of people in this country don't eat enough fiber. And um, they're consuming like 10 to 15 grams of fiber a day when we really should be consuming about 25 to 38 grams of fiber. Uh, uh, and um, it's a little different for women and men and your fiber consumption is a little lower as you age. So. Uh, people older than 50, they, they um, would have about 21 to 30 grams. But the, there are different types of fiber. There's insoluble and soluble fiber. And the soluble fiber it dissolves in water and it forms a gel. And in that, in that form of fiber, it lowers cholesterol levels, it lowers the risk of heart disease and regulates blood sugar. Uh, and it's found in black beans, lima beans, Brussels sprouts, avocados, sweet potatoes, broccoli, turnips, and pears. Insoluble fiber is the stuff that doesn't digest and it helps move the stool uh, through the colon and it helps with constipation uh, and regulates our bowel movements. So um, that's gonna be more like the whole wheat, the grains, the, grain, the wheat bran, the flour, the cauliflower, excuse me, green beans and potatoes. So you, you need both of those. But again, um, why is this important? Well, there was a meta-analysis of about 250 studies that confirmed on a large scale that eating lots of fiber from vegetables, fruits, and whole grains can decrease your risk of dying from heart disease and cancer. Um, and those who ate the most fiber reduced their risk of dying from cardiac disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and or colon cancer by 16 to 24%. And that's a huge that's reduction mm -hmm. compared to people who ate very little fiber. And the study also said that more is better. It's kind of like exercise. Mm -hmm. um, is for every additional eight grams of dietary fiber a person consumed, the risk for um, for each of the diseases fell by another five to 27%. Wow. And I don't, I'm really, before I started researching this, it's, you don't really no hear any of this. Mm -hmm. And then of course, it does help with weight control as well, uh, the benefits of high fiber diet, and it makes you feel um, more full. So if you eat a diet that is high in fat and high in sugar and low in fiber, it just goes right through mm -hmm. you so that basically you wanna eat again pretty quickly. If you have fiber in there, it slows the absorption of things through your intestine so that you get a, a really a, not a big pulse of your blood sugar. So how do you get more fiber? So um, you can get more fiber strategies by doing a high fiber cereal, you do um, eat more vegetables, dried beans, um, peas, add peas to soup. You could add nuts, seeds, um, and fruit to your plain yogurt or to your salad. Um, I love pumpkin seeds. That's mm -hmm. a great source of protein and for fiber. Uh, you can do a vegetarian chili, you eat berries, nuts, seeds, uh, all different kinds of things. One of my things is that I take um, carrots, those little mini carrots that are different colors, and I um, steam them. And then I just put a little avocado spray and this garlic stuff that I get from downtown. And I just put them in the fridge, in the steamer thing. I leave them in there. And then after work, if I want to munch, I get a few of those out as opposed to chips. And if I want a protein, then I just use it with the hummus. Excellent idea. Okay. Um, how can you really be successful at changing your diet and what works? Like you said, it takes time. Mm -hmm. You really got to be patient with yourself because this is not something where you're going to do a fad diet and, and you're done. Um, this is really a lifetime process. 
like we're saying, the lifestyle medicine really shows all of this. If you have a real interest, there's a whole, um, the blue zones are really, um, really fascinating to watch because these are people that really have a very good diet over life and they live quite a long uh, life because of that. But the, these, these are my big things that I, I try to tell people is, is make sure you get your facts straight and use the facts that are, that are fact-based. Um, and there's all kinds of resources out there. There's gonna be some post notes that Melissa's gonna put on um, after the talk or, or LC. And you can see where we have the American Institute of uh, Cancer Research or what we call AIC. Are, and they have a form that uh, get the facts. I think it's stick to the science. And they have exactly. a whole web page there that you can actually look at Mythbusters and see what are the things that are um, th that are just not true. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is things are changing. I mean, we used yes. to tell people to eat um, small, frequent meals. Yes. I mean, we have totally gotten away from that. And now we have feeding times. We yes. have intermittent fasting mm -hmm. and everything else. So make sure you get your facts straight. And then um, also see what works for you because everything is, you know, it's not a one diet fits size fits everybody. You have to see what works for you exactly. and then um, just try it and then make notes when things don't work well. Don't be afraid that if you that you don't succeed, that you just try something a little different or tweak it a little bit. Uh, in the end, um, we're all struggling with weight. And um, the biggest thing that I, I myself have said uh, is that I don't know why I'm not losing weight or I don't know why I'm gaining weight. And I, I cringe because I actually have said this. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really got to figure out what, what you're putting in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can figure out what you're putting in your mouth is if you make notes about what yes. you put in your mouth. Yes, so, agree. but it's easier now. I mean, even on my fitness pal, you can take a picture of your food and it actually, you don't even have to put it in there or wow, scan the barcode. It takes a picture and it says blueberries and then it tells you what's up there. Oh, so that's there's, exciting. it's just yeah. way too, it's very, very easy. And so I have always had to go back to that to when I struggle with my weight, even when someone like me thinks I know everything. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't. Yeah. I don't know always what I'm putting in my mouth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> or sometimes you just say, I'm going to eat it anyway, even though yeah. you know it's not good for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the other thing I'm doing, I had to get back to is, um, is not do multitasking. Yes. So I'm back to eating at a table. Yes. Because your body never, you don't multitask. You really just task switch. Right. So you you do need to sit at a table or whatever, wherever you're going to sit and actually eat as opposed to watch TV or play on your phone or something else. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And um, what if your family is unwilling to change their yeah. diet with you? That's really difficult. Yeah. I have had people say, I cook one way for myself but I cook all different ways for the rest of my family. I know. You hear the first people yeah. cooking two, three, four yeah. meals in the dinner. And it, it just, it's, it's hard to, to do that. So some of the strategies that we have um, heard that have worked is number one, sometimes you just have to be attraction versus promotion. So you, you just have to do it for sometimes a few years. We have um, one of the staff members here, her husband would not go willingly. And it took, I think he said two years for him mm -hmm. to transition. So sometimes you just have to be the example and just exercise it, utmost patience. But with kids, it's a little different. If you have kids, you can involve them in meal planning. You can take them shopping. Um, you can have them pick out what they want to, to cook and then create a vegetable that, you know, the, the diet, the meal around that vegetable. And then one of the things I started doing, and I'm not saying everybody can do this, but I pick um, what I'm going to buy sometimes and I don't look at the prices. Mm -hmm. I look at what looks prettiest and then I buy it in terms of, because if you're not eating meat, you, you really have a little bit more latitude about what you can buy. And it is amazing how much different vegetables and fruits can taste if you just buy them by, if they look better than the others. Mm -hmm. And by all means, don't buy pre-cut things because they've just been sitting for that much longer and they're just not going to taste as no. good. Mm -hmm. no, they're not. Avoid the H word and the V word. The, and Pam, it's Melissa. I'm going to jump in and ask a few questions because we have some good ones in the chat box. Oh, yeah, sure. And yeah, I'll talk forever. We will. Yeah, we will. I, I love what you said about the pre-cut because it's always um it's always a easy go-to, but I've never thought about that. Uh, I, but I do buy pre-cut onions because I don't like to cut them up when it hurts your eyes too much. Um, so we have Bobby McIntyre asks, what books and in books, recipe, and informational, do you recommend to start a plant-based diet? So what have been some of your favorites? Well, so I actually, it's in my, um, it'll be in the post notes 
because it's the physicians for physicians for responsible PCRM mm -hmm. and it's the link and they have how to become a vegan in 21 days. And it's a short little book. And that's really what I used uh, to do this. And there's some other tools on that webpage, but they're, um, it, it really helped me transition, but I will say that I had to clean out my, my um, freezer and my house and I gave someone else a lot, a lot of food. And I mean, I think I had frozen scallops and everything else, but I, I did do this total clean out when I decided to do it. Now that might not work for everybody. You know, it might be more of a transition, particularly if you have family members, members that are not willing to go. Yeah. I did want to say, Melissa, though, just as an interest that you said you buy pre-cut onions, you may want to rethink that. Onions absorb a lot of things. And when they've done the studies of food poisoning and um, in terms of uh, egg salads or, or macaroni salads and things, I think it was macaroni salads, it was the onions in there that absorb the, um, the you know, pathogens and the, mm -hmm. the, the bat. The, the, in fact, never, ever eat any pork onions when it's at a salad bar or anything because they absorb all kinds of things. Okay, interesting. Uh, so we have another question which asks, what about vitamins and supplements? What is your opinion on that? Well, if you're a vegan, you need a little B12. So that, that's one, one thing that you, if you are choosing to be plant-based, you do need B12. Uh, and that's just something you can't get around. Uh, we really don't like supplements. Life, the Academy of Lifestyle Medicine does not um, like supplements because it's switching from, from food to something that's extracted from food. And then in the end, that's not going to help in terms of um, the whole consistency of the food going into your body. But on the other hand, there's supplements that people do have to take like vitamin D3. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it depends on the supplement, uh, but, but if you are plant-based, you will need B12. And we, ACLM does not recommend supplements. They recommend whole plant-based foods. Okay. And then what, where are we now with intermittent fasting? Oh gosh, we are, we are there. We are actually yeah. there. It's, um, I think some people even call it feeding times. And you can do it all different kinds of ways. You can do um, 12 hours on and, and, and then the, uh, you know, the uh, 16 hours off, I think. Yeah. 12, 16, you could do, uh, you can do it all different ways. You can do eight hours when you eat. Uh, you can actually do even, you know, plain fasting a few times a year as well. You have to be pretty healthy to do the plain water only fasting. But the intermittent fasting, people are having luck with in terms of weight loss because your body is a machine and your body is, is breaking down all of these things when you eat this food. Well, it really doesn't rest when it's digesting. So that's why intermittent fasting is helpful for your body because uh, you allow the body to shut down for a little period of time and to just do the essential functions. And then when it's eating, it's actually actively eating and people eat, they tend to eat less and they get filled, they do fill up quicker. Right, and I find that probably the easiest way to do an intermittent fasting would be to say to yourself, okay, I'm gonna get all my nutrients in by like seven o'clock in the evening. And after that, I'm just going to drink water. And then, um, and then you, you know, fast basically from seven o'clock in the evening till um, breakfast the next morning. But it is important to start your day with a really good breakfast. And the other thing about, intermittent fasting is you need a physician's guidance if you're a diabetic because you can run into a lot of problems um, with intermittent fasting it, with your blood sugars dropping so that's really um, you know something that really needs guidance yeah yeah it's yeah. a little hard sometimes to begin it but it's funny how you, you people think they need to eat constantly but you really don't need as much food as you think you need. <laughs> right. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. And I think it's a good point to make that, you know, to make intermittent fasting and to try it in a way that again, works for you. You might not be able to do the full 12 hours. Some people work better with 10. So um, that is a good point. Well, I can, if we want to get back to the presentation and then we can go back to a few more questions or I can continue on. We do have some good questions in the chat box. Um, 
Well, let's finish. Uh, we have one more thing from Gina and then we can do some more questions before I start my piece with yeah. the exercise. Um, so Gina, what have you been up to recently with your diet that's very exciting? So I am known for curiosity, I will say that. <laughs> so I, I don't know, I, I'm into podcasting and there are some uh, links on some of the podcasts that I really like, but I, I started um, finding out about sprouting and I really didn't know what sprouting was. And so uh, we investigated that, we bought some sprouting kits and I don't know if you can see this, but it's, it's a little glass jar. And this is a smaller one, you use a bigger one, but sprouts, you have to buy seeds that are, that are um, sprouting seeds because regular seeds uh, have fungicides and everything else in them. But when you look at sprouts, they have a lot more nutrients because they, uh, they basically have all these less inhibition because the seed is starting to sprout and there's a lot more micronutrients compared to whether it's a broccoli seed or something else. So there's a lot of anti-inflammatory characteristics. There's also a whole lot more fiber. So there's more fiber, but there's also more digestibility. So if you can't eat a lot of beans, you can do some of these sprouting beans. And it seems like I, I can tolerate them a little bit better. But the, the, the other thing though, is that it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier than I thought it was going to be because you don't need sunlight. These um, sprout in about two to five days and you just put like a few teaspoons in here and this, you have to use special water that's just the purified water because you don't want all those impurities mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. Then after about 12 hours, you kind of drain them and then you just rinse them every 12 hours. There's a little cheesecloth right there that, and you can buy special caps. And then in about two to five days, you have sprouts in there. And there's, um, there's a, Doug Evans is, is the really the sprout guru and there's this book and again this is on there too but it's a uh, it just talks that there's all kinds of recipes in there and um it's it's just been really something that you can do it's almost like you can grow a garden even though you don't have a garden mm -hmm. so that's been kind of fun and i can tell you i think i actually feel better and because it has a little higher fiber and like they have soy sprouts so they have some that have higher protein it's actually something fun to do. And, and I put that with some hummus now for, um, for lunch. Very good. Thanks. Okay, right. Melissa. Um, I think um, Gina's done with her, her section. So um, do you want to ask, ask yeah. some questions? Yeah. I will go ahead and ask a few more of our questions. Um, we had somebody ask, what's the H word and the V word? Oh, yeah. I didn't say that. This one. Yeah. H is healthy, um, V is vegan. So like if you say to your family, this is healthy or you know, we're gonna become vegans, I'm, especially the V word. If you say you're gonna become a vegan, oh my gosh, I mean, people's hair just goes straight up. Yeah. So plant-based is a much friendlier term. And the other thing is you don't have to be 100% of anything. You know, If you wanna be 85% plant-based, you can be 85% plant-based. So sorry, I, I got to talking too fast. Yeah, I like that. I think it's it's much more easy for people to digest when you don't always have to put a strict label on it and just stick to eating mostly plant-based. Um, so we had somebody said, I like to roast vegetables, but no, it can contribute to the creating of carcinogens. Could you speak about what is safe to roast and how to go about it? Well, some of the problem is, is what are you using to put on there to roast? Because there, there's, there's this thing about dairy and, and a, you know, being plant-based, you really are dairy-free. So uh, you just gotta be careful if you're using more of a butter or something like that. But then the other thing is if you're using meats and if you're using, you're grilling meats with all of that, it's not necessarily grilling vegetables that's carcinogenic. It's that it's, are you on a grill that you're grilling meats and there's the fat there that goes onto the hot, charcoals, which then cause the carcinogenic material that then goes and smokes all your vegetables. That's probably the simplest way I could say it. And I would say if, if you have or can get an Instapot, yeah. that will change the way you eat your vegetables because they turn out absolutely fantastic and only take five minutes. So uh, for people yeah. that are on a time crunch, that's a really great way to cook vegetables and get the best taste. And beans. And beans, beans, beans yes, are yeah, fabulous. Yeah. Everything that you cook in a crock pot turns out fantastic. So um, that's how I um, ended up eating more vegetables is somebody bought me a, a Instapot and I was like, okay, comes with a little sheet that tells you how long you have to cook your vegetables for. And it was like 
two minutes, three minutes. Uh, and so it really changed the way I ate um, and I use it regularly. Awesome. Um, so somebody said, how do you judge how much water you need? And I'm guessing that's when you're boiling a vegetable, um, if that will take away from any of the nutrient content. Well, steaming is always better. Mm -hmm. So I, I use as little water as I can. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't really want to, it used to be that people put lots of water into everything, but that, that you're, when you pour that water off, that's where your nutrients are. So yes, that's true. All right, and I think we are good to take it from here. We had somebody mention they do broccoli sprouts and they are excellent. So we broccoli, have a yes, thank you. Sprouter in the group. That's great. I think broccoli sprouts have the most um, anti-inflammatories anti and pro-oxidants in it. So that's really the, the big wonder that they yes. just they just cannot replicate that in other broccoli, no. just regular broccoli. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, and you and if you don't like the taste of seeds, you can put them in shake something. Yes, so, so, yes, and then you really don't taste it. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm okay. Yes. Questions. Let's talk talk exercise. All right. <laughs> so Pam, what's changed about the second edition of the physical activity guidelines for Americans? Okay, so just give you a little bit of a history. The first edition came out in 2008. Um, American College of Sports Medicine um, recommended the guidelines of 150 minutes of exercise aerobically a week. And what they recommended was 30 minutes a day um, and then two to three days of some type of strength training. And so, you know, they plugged that from 2008 onwards. And it was quite rigid in the fact that they still they recommended 30 minutes a day. Um, so over the last 10 years, they've gathered a, an enormous amount of research and they revamped the guidelines in 2018. And what they found was even a 10 minute walk briskly um, can give you 12 hours benefit from a blood pressure, blood cholesterol and blood sugar standpoint. So, you know, obviously the guidelines, the whole goal for the guidelines is to decrease chronic disease, which in the United States is um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancers. Um, so now what they did with the 2018 guidelines was they broke the guidelines down to include all populations of people. So from kindergarten um, to school age, um, adult, and then what was even more exciting was age 65 and older, which is a huge population of people. And so they said, anything is better than nothing. And, and this is exciting for the over 65 population because um, you know, if they have functional mobility issues or any kind of problems, then anything throughout the day is, of, of movement is good. Um, and it just needs to add up to 150 minutes a week. So it's really great because this just means that you don't have to be stressed out that you have to go for a 30 minute walk every day. If you don't have time, you can just go for a 10 minute brisk walk every day. And then that will give you benefit and make you feel better and improve your metabolism. And then you want to do more. Um, and I think that's the key is just getting people moving. They do say that the leading cause of death in the United States is sedentary lifestyle because it leads to all of the other problems that we have, such as obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancers. Um, so just to remember, when we talk about brisk walk, um, the key to, you know, people ask me, how do I know how, if I'm walking good enough? Um, if you can talk but cannot sing while you're walking, that's a moderate pace. And then if it's a vigorous pace, you, um, you're short of breath and you um, can't talk or sing. So it gives you some idea as you're walking. And I try and tell people to just try and do intervals. So start out with a slow pace. You have 10 minutes that you're walking, you know, a couple of minutes to warm up, then one minute as fast as you can, and then slow it down until you get, feel better. And then, you know, it, speed it up, slow it down, speed it up until you're done because that, um, exercises your muscles m m and your cardiovascular system really well, and you'll be able to do more. 
Um, obviously walking is the easiest way to exercise, but you can do anything that you want, swim, bike, skate, dance. It doesn't have to be a specific exercise as long as you're moving. Um, and um, you know, it's funny because we, when people get sick, mm -hmm. particularly not necessarily our age, but a little older, mm -hmm. the, the first thing that, that other people well meaning say is rest. Yes. And which or is if wrong. they've had a cancer diagnosis, like they people bring over all these cancer rules and tell people just, you know, don't need yeah. to do anything. Mm -hmm. And we don't say that. No. Just for the record, that is not what we tell patients. No, when we see when we see our cancer patients that are going through chemotherapy in our office. We tell them that the only way, research has shown the only way to combat the fatigue associated with um, cancer is to exercise. So um, as much as they can do, even if it's only five minutes at a time, it's going to be beneficial. And Pam, just to clarify, because we get this yeah. too with them, uh, if you're mall walking with a friend um, and they're talking, what kind of conversation can it be to get your aerobic, to get your cardio? Okay, you can talk. <laughs> But try singing. And if, <laughs> if you can't sing to each other, then you're walking at a good pace. All right. Okay. Good, yeah. Good, good rule. All right. Um, and then um, I thought we talked about the aerobic thing. Yeah, we've done that. One. So yeah. research has shown that most people will maintain some type of aerobic exercise, but tend to slack off on the resistance and muscle strength exercise over time. Tell us, Pam, why you think um, or how to keep us motivated to do the resistance or strength training. Sure. Uh, I mean, so <clears throat> research, uh, they did a research study that showed that people love to walk once they get into the exercise, but over time, the resistance exercise drops off because it's boring. You know, if you go to the gym and I've experienced this, if you go to the, and it's overwhelming, if you go to the gym and you look at all of those machines and you're like, I have to exercise every one of those machines to get some benefit. You're like, it's so dull. Um, so what you really have to do is find out what excites you um, and, and exercise from a resistance standpoint can be um, isometric exercises, which is where you strengthen your own body using your own body. And there are many um, uh, classes on YouTube. You don't necessarily have to go to a gym. You can find them and do them at home and they're anywhere from, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how much time you have. Um, resistance exercises using bands is a very good way to strengthen your muscles. Um, and you can now that, you know, there's two sets of uh, resistance bands, the stretchy rubber bands that usually we get from the physical therapist when we go to the physical therapist. But now you can go either order online or go to um, PJ Maxx or somewhere like that. They have these really thick um, cloth resistance bands, usually in two or three um, strengths. And you can exercise really easy with those as well. And you can find resistance exercise um, programs also on YouTube. And so I, I highly recommend that people just go to um, YouTube and type in whatever it is that you want to exercise with from a resistance standpoint, and you'll be surprised at how many good quality um, exercise classes there are online. So you don't even have to go to a gym. And you were um, pretty creative because you actually did a lot of your exercising during COVID. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. By YouTube. So yes. You, you discovered all these. Yes, there's some great, and I'll, I'll put a list of some of them um, for you to look at, but it depends on, you know, what, where you are as far as an exercise. It, there are some very intense ones, but there's some very, very good low impact isometric exercises um, that you can start with. And I have some of my patients doing some of those. Um, and, um, and you really will see the benefit over time if you're consistent. And I would say that's the, probably the most important thing when you're doing resistance exercises is consistency and commitment. And that's starting out strong. And that's starting yeah. out strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the most important thing about resistance exercises is it helps improve your metabolism so that the calories you put in 
are utilized by your body so that you don't gain weight. And then you're strengthening your muscles so that um, as you grow older, you don't have the, the natural um, muscle loss for aging and um, you don't become a frail elderly person. If you do nothing, you will. You will, yes. If you do nothing, you will lose your muscle mass over time. I think by the time you turn 70, if you don't lose, your, if you don't use your muscles, you lose, you've lost about 37% of your muscle mass. So it really is important um, to just get started. Um, there is a way to do it, and that's called exercise snacking, which seems to be the big uh, push now is, you know, people doing a 30 minute exercise um, class for resistance exercises, they may decide they don't have time for that. But what they found was uh, exercise has shown that even if you do a 10 minute, that seems to be the time frame for the best um, getting started. Even if you do 10 minutes of some type of resistance exercise, that is equal to the benefit that you get if you do a 30 minute exercise. So the exercise snacking is just, they looked at those blue zones. The blue zones are where people live the longest based on their lifestyle. And what they found was that these people are constantly moving. They move about every 20 minutes, they're doing something. And so that is the key. And, um, so, uh, um, sorry, I lost my so train of thought at, then. Sitting at night for is two, three hours good. Yes. watching a baseball game. <laughs> right. So this is what I was, so the other day um, I was exercising and I was doing a resistance band exercise and the trainer has the exercise band around the top part of the legs, just above the knee and was bent down in kind of a little bit of a squat position. And she, the, the resistance bands only allow you to move your body very slightly. So she was walking back and forth across the room, across her mat. And she was saying that, you know, when you're watching the TV or you're doing something at home, you can just kind of go move back and forth across your living room with those bands on your um, legs and you get benefit. Yeah, so you, it's the thing you don't like yeah. doing the resistance you could be doing. And yes, yes, about it. right. So these this snacking is really good. And I um, I highly recommend it. I've, there's some YouTube videos and I'll post, I'll have Melissa post those so that you can take a look at them. I love the name. Yes. <laughs> so what are common excuses for next, not exercising and can you come up with a suggestion? Okay. I'm sure you hear it all. Yes. <laughs> so the number one common excuse is I don't have time. That's the biggest one. So here's the thing to remember. You really have to kind of trick your mind about this and find times during the day to exercise. So the exercise snacking helps. Going up and down stairs at work helps. But if you remember that there's 1,440 minutes in every day and you only have to do 10 20, 30 minutes of exercise a day. And I would break it down, just start at 10 minutes of aerobic and 10, minute, 10 minutes of aerobic three times a week is what I tell my patients. And then on the opposite days, because resistant exercises are only two to three days a week. So just pick two days a week and just do a 10 minute snack, right? So then you're doing something every day that's aerobic, and resistance, and it's not meeting the guidelines yet, but I can tell you pretty much if you're committed to it and you're consistent, you will get to meet and reach those guidelines and probably exceed those guidelines because you feel so much better. Um, so what they recommend is finding time for things we value, and we should definitely value our body. And so exercise to benefit our body is the key, okay? Um, the next one is I'm too tired. Um, but just think, remember, um, if you exercise and be more active in your life, you'll have more energy. Um, and yeah, so you the wouldn't think that occurs because you're no, gonna be you tired. Yeah. But really over time, yes. you have more energy. And I can, I can attest to this because, you know, as we work in our offices all day long, talking to patients, 
you know, all day long, it takes so much energy. And so by the end of the day, you're like, oh, I just want to go home and sit down. And so I go home and as soon as I get home, I walk my dog. And when I get back, I have so much energy and then I'm able to actually do more what more exercise if I want to or go out into the garden. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the more you do, the more energy you'll have and the more excited you'll feel about exercise. OK, the next one, if you've got children, is I just don't get a break from my kids. Well, just include your children in the exercise. Um, take them for a walk to the park, take them for a walk around the block. And what I do is I, um, I don't walk, I skip for a little while or jumping jacks and, and things like fun. that to make it fun. Yeah. And, um, and, and the kids will love it and they'll want to keep doing it and you'll both be getting um, benefit. The other one is exercise is boring. And so we've talked a little bit about that. And really it's, you know, anything that you do that's active would be considered exercise so gardening dancing skating hiking um swimming raking leaves yeah raking yeah. leaves anything is is going to be beneficial so sometimes if i work in the garden in the afternoon on the weekends i don't really do any other exercise because i know that that is um my exercise for the day um and then if you can find a group or find a friend to exercise with you because it's much more interesting to um, exercise with another person. And you won't skip it. And you won't skip it because yeah. you've got to hold yourself accountable to that person. And then mix it up so you don't get bored. You don't have to do the same thing every day. You can do all kinds of different things. And there's so much out there to just try, you know? Um, if you don't like it, then you say, oh, I don't want to do that anymore, but at least you tried. Okay, next one. Um, I just don't like to move. And so for this, figure out why you don't like to move. Is it because you don't like to get sweaty? I mean, that's, you know, I, I get that. Um, so um, find some exercise in the air conditioning or a fan on you so you don't actually sweat. Ride a bike. Ride a bike. You don't sweat. Walk your dog um, and do, or do low impact um, exercise such as yoga or swimming, things like that. If it's hard on your joints, for sure, the best exercise is to find a pool. You get really, really good low impact resistance exercises in the pool. And then if you're overweight <clears throat> and you've got to start somewhere um, and you don't want to join a gym because you're around, you know, people that look buff and, you know, all that stuff makes you feel self-conscious, just start walking. Walk with a friend, <clears throat> work out at home or find a personal trainer that comes to your home. Um, you know, there's lots of different things that you can do. Um, and another one is, and I'm almost done. I have tried before and it never worked, okay? So there's a whole theory about exercise change. <laughs> and um, so we teach our patients change theory because we try and figure out where they are in that whole change theory so we can help them understand why they're not exercising at the time they come to me. Um, and the problem with um, any kind of behavior change is you go back and forth into those um, different um, change stages until you finally get it to become a lifestyle change, mm -hmm. which can it takes six months for something to become a lifestyle change. Um, and you can drop off that exercise really easy because all of all these um, excuses that we make for ourselves. Um, New story. We have to. Oh, okay. Story. All right. So we'll, we've got a couple more questions. And so I'll include my story. All right. So, number so how five. do you get motivated to start and maintain an exercise program? Okay. So um, motivation, boy, what, how hard is that when you're not exercising? I remember when I start, because I've stopped and started exercise a lot. And when I came to CIOS, I was like, I'm going to join the Life Center because it's right across the street. Yeah. And I would come out of work at the end of the day. And for me to go home, I have to just go on the feeder road around the hospital to Grove Road. Or if I went to the gym, I could just go to the light. I mean, I, I have to go the same way. And I would just, my car took me down the feeder road. It was just like, it was not going to the gym. And so I just would say, okay, I'm going to go a different way. 
So I did, I decided to go past the gym instead of the feeder road. Yeah, wow. um, and then what I tell people to do is um, if, you, if you go to the gym, but you've slacked off on your gym and you're just paying rent money to the gym, just get into your clothes and go to the gym and just sit in your car in the parking lot and watch the people come and go. Mm -hmm. Because it will motivate you to go inside. Mm -hmm. Then once you're inside, you got to do something, right? And even if you only do it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, at least it will get you in the gym. The thing, remember, is make your plan and fit it to your life, not the other way around. And be happy with it. If you're not happy when you're exercising, then you need to change it up, mm -hmm. right? Um, and be inspired by it. Um, and just the other thing is watch the clock. And when we talk about that, that's your body clock. You have to try and figure out what is the best time for me to exercise. And if it's in the morning, then just like every other thing in your diary, you write that event down. So you every day, nine o'clock, I'm going to do some kind of exercise and you use it as an appointment that you're supposed like to have, you like a doctor's teeth. appointment. You yeah. Now yeah. You do this right. Um, because there is no perfect time to exercise. You know, they say, oh, exercise in the afternoon, exercise in the morning is better for you. It's, it doesn't matter. It has to work for you and finding the time that you can have that quiet time to yourself to exercise. Um, and so I will say the best thing I can tell you is you'll have ups and downs, but just hang in there because you will see results. And so I will tell you my story. Um, so I, as I say, we, we've been learning the um, lifestyle medicine um, program. I, um, I decided I needed to get into shape and, um, and not have another heart attack. And this was recently, it took me nine years from my heart attack to get to that point that I needed to get in better shape. And I think the um, American College of Lifestyle Medicine showed me that. So what I did was, and for me, it was easy because COVID happened. And so I'd been going to the gym and the gym closed because of COVID. And so I was like, okay, I've got to figure out what to do. So I started walking in my neighborhood, but because I was overweight, I was very clumsy. And every time I went to walk, I tripped over the pavers and fell. So I fell about four or five times and just not able to pick up my feet properly. And, um, and then I was walking one day and I fell and I broke my arm. And I was like, okay, walking's not for me. You know, it's, <laughs> like, it's just not for me. So my other thing is cycling. I've always cycled. So I was like, well, I'll just cycle on the Swamp Rabbit Trail. And the Swamp Rabbit Trail was so busy and horrible that I was just like, yeah, I can't do this, it's too stressful. And, um, and so my husband said, okay, we'll find an exercise bike at home. So we've had exercise bikes before that have just sat as a um, clothes horse and we've not done anything about it. We've got rid of it. So we got the bike, mm -hmm. we put it in the living room. We put all our weights in the living room. Um, we put a big, huge mirror in the living room that we can see when we work out. So the living room kind of became my gym. And so I said, okay, COVID, we're in lockdown. There's nothing else to do. So I might as well just get on that bike. So I um, used YouTube. There's a couple of great um, channels on YouTube. One was Bicycle the World. And the other one was in, uh, cycling indoor cycling videos. And they were the most gorgeous places to cycle. And of course, you know, I've got a big screen TV. And I would put that on and put my music on as loud as I could. And I just exercised, ten, I rode 10 miles every day. And nobody in the house could come in and talk to me while I was doing it. I was just like, this is my time. I'll talk to you when I get done. And so I did that for a long time and I watched what I ate and I decided, and it was easy because it was COVID because you couldn't go out and get any food either. I was like, okay, my body is a temple and I'm only going to put food in my body that's good. And it's food is the fuel for my body, right? So I changed the way I thought about food. And you know what happened? The weight started dropping off. 
I also increased my fiber. One of my patients told me about how she lost her belly fat and I was like, I'm gonna try that. And that worked amazingly. So over the last year, so I did the aerobic exercise only and about three months into that, I was like, okay, I need to do the resistance exercises. And one of the people on the Moving On um, Facebook page said, check this, check this exercise out. It was called How to Lose Your Arm Fat. You know, as we get older, we always have those uh, fat areas on our arms. And I was like, I'm going to check that out and see what it's like. And it was just fabulous. So the, the trainer was great. And so I just started working out to that trainer. And I worked out every day, different parts of my body. Um, and, um, and then over time, it's just changed. I've changed the way I've eaten. I don't eat processed food very often. I'm not saying I'm 100% perfect. I gave up dairy. I eat more vegetables. I really concentrate on how much protein I eat in my diet and how much fiber I eat. And, and I drink more water. Um, in fact, you bring a big jug. With yeah, I bring day. a gallon jug to work every day that's graduated. And I put, I take it out of that into a glass every day and I try and get that in. So I have lost um, 40 pounds and um, from a cholesterol and standpoint. How tall are you? I'm five foot one. Just so everybody knows. Yeah. That, that's yeah. a lot of weight. And, um, and uh, I've gone down from a size 12 to a size four. And, um, and I feel the best that I've ever felt in my entire life. And, um, and my cholesterol, because that was a big thing for me because of my heart disease, my LDL, I could never get my LDL to goal, which for me was 70. And the last time I had my cholesterol checked, it was my LDL is 54. So it, it, it's doable and it will change your life and give you the energy that you need to live the rest of your life healthy. All right, so that's, uh, that's it for me. Melissa? I love that. Such great advice and a wonderful personal story. Um, we have a, we have a few good questions about exercise. So can you do resistance exercise and aerobic exercise in the same day, or should they be spaced out? They don't have to be. I mean, this is all about how much time you have. So, um, if you have the time to do both, you can do both. And there are people that do both and I do both. So when I exercise now, I go walk the dog, I come back and I ride my 10 miles on the bike and then I do my 30 minute resistance exercise. Um, and I do that every other day because you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't work out the same muscles every day, right? So you've got to give your muscles the chance to rest and repair because when you exercise, you're breaking down the muscle tissue and then once you eat your protein and rest, it's restoring them stronger. Um, so it's not recommended to do the same exercises every day. You could do like abs and buttocks, you know, like some of those exercises, um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then you could do um, legs and arms, uh, you know, so you can kind of space it up. The nice thing about the programs on YouTube is some of the exercises are as, as little as five minutes. Mm -hmm. So you can do a five minute ab that's just strengthening your abs, five minute ab every other day, along with like a 10 minute arms um, on those same days. You've got to try and figure out, okay, which exercises do I want to work together? Which muscle groups do I want to work together? And, you know, it takes time to figure that out. Um, but as long as you don't, uh, you know, it's all about having fun with it, but not injuring yourself. And if you are following somebody that's, that's you know, a, a trainer on, on YouTube, you don't have to keep up with them to begin with, you know, because they're fit, fit people. Mm -hmm. And you may not be able to do the same amount of repetitions. And you don't have to use weights. That's the, that's the benefit of some of these programs is it's isometric exercises and you will strengthen your muscles. Yes, that is good advice to use the YouTube videos as a guide. Yes. 
Um, so we had somebody ask, what is the moving on site you mentioned? Oh yeah, so unfortunately the moving on program um, is our oncology rehab program. So for our cancer patients that are coming out from um, chemotherapy, uh, we have an exercise program that they work with the personal trainer to help them get stronger. And the personal trainers will teach them how to continue to exercise after they get done. Now, there are similar programs for people that are non-cancer patients. Um, there is um, the Exercises Medicine Greenville program, which is done all the wise around town and, um, and the Life Center. And you do the same thing. It's a 12-week program. Um, there is a cost to it, but you have free membership to the gym for that whole 12 weeks, and it's working with a personal trainer to teach you how to exercise. Um, so those options in Greenville um, uh, are, are really quite good if that's what you need. And then what's the open arms like? Yes. I can't afford it. Can't right. So if you have any limited finances, the YMCA's all over, wherever you live, if there's a YMCA in your area, they have what's called an open doors policy. So they do not turn anybody away. If you can't afford the membership and you're on a fixed income, just ask them to help you financially because they have loads of grant money that will help pay your membership. And if you don't ask, you don't know. Um, so the other option I tell people for over 65, if you're Medicare, check out your insurance company for silver sneakers because that's a free program covered by your insurance. And it varies depending on your insurance, where it goes, but there's, it's always a gym. Sometimes it's the Y, sometimes it's Anytime Fitness, sometimes it's, um, what's the other one? Total Fitness. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good option. And the other thing that I learned is the other day from a patient was the um, Senior Action Center in Greenville has now moved to a new location. It used to be on Orchard Park behind the post office um, before you got to Patewood, mm -hmm. but now it's moved to a new location on North Street. You know where, uh, hopefully you all know where the Tuesday morning is, up there on North mm -hmm. Street and um, Haywood. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's in that shopping center um, by where the Tuesday morning is. I think it's up in the corner um, and that's the new senior action center. And they have um, a gym. And I think the membership for the senior action center is $25 a year. It's like really, really inexpensive. Um, so we'll try and find that number and then you can, um, you can try and see. Yeah, and we can include the links in yeah. our show notes to yeah. uh, mm -hmm. these programs that we've mentioned. Right. And we have another great question about fiber and belly fat. What fiber did you use when you mentioned it reducing your yeah. belly fat? Um, so the patient, the patient that told me all about this um, was a researcher and she needed to lose her belly fat. And so she said, I'm going to research it. When I come back to see you, I'm going to tell you what I did and I'm going to get rid of my belly fat. And I said, okay. So what she did, she researched all the sources of, fiber in cereal. And so she was wanting the most natural cereal. And so she found the biggest bang for your buck for the serving size per amount of fiber was Kellogg's Old Brand Buds. And so for a third of a cup, I think you get about 11 or 12 grams of fiber just in that third of a cup of Old Brand Buds. And, and then she put berries on um, and she researched the berries as far as what had the biggest amount of fiber, and it was raspberries. So she did blueberries, blackberries, raspberries on her um, cereal, and then she did some kind of non-dairy milk. So I did that. I did all of those, all of that, and um, almond milk. And, um, and then the other thing she did was, um, and there's a lot of talk now about apple cider vinegar. Mm -hmm being a, 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 you know, an antioxidant and, and, and does a lot for your body, helps with your metabolism. And so she drank uh, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar um, in a V8 juice. 
And she did that once a day and she drank more water and she ate more vegetables. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to do this and see what happens. And I think um, I uh, am in that CCPW study. And I think I lost, I can't remember how much fat I lost, lost off my um, belly from December until I did the one in September. Um, was like huge it was like eight pounds or I mean just some ridiculous wow, amount of just lot. fat loss um so it's it, I mean it really can be done um increasing your fiber definitely makes a difference it's a really and, good book too, yeah. fiber fuel by Dr. yeah um, so if you really are interested in fiber uh, I think I have it in my somewhere called fiber fuel yeah. And you can change your microbiome, your flora, mm -hmm. by changing your diet within 24 hours of right. what you eat. Yes. And as you change your flora and your gut, your cravings actually change. They do. You don't really, you things that you might have craved in the past, you don't crave anymore. Right. And I find, you know, if I exercise really hard on the days that I exercise, when I get home from work, um, it makes me not want to eat right? It makes me not hungry. So what I do is I do a protein shake as soon as I get done, because they say, you know, try and do some form of protein 20 minutes after a hard workout. So, um, so I do my protein shake, shake, and then I think, okay, I can't just last on that because it doesn't do anything for me. Um, so and then I, I just have like hummus and olives and, um, and, and just small things, like sometimes I'll eat just like a couple of pieces of, you know, uh, sprouted grain bread with peanut butter on, um, you know, so it makes me eat much less food. And I think that's really helped with the weight loss, you know, mm -hmm. so we believe it. All right, let's see. We have we have a, a couple of people said they would subscribe to this podcast. So we. We have a following beginning. And then, good. <laughs> another good question. Uh, is it harmful to use aluminum foil when roasting veggies in the oven? I don't really know. I do know. I don't know that. I don't know that either. No. I don't know that I've ever read that. No, I do know I'm changing to glass instead of plastic. Pouring up yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think if you... Um, if you roast your vegetables in, um, I don't know necessarily that you have to do, cover them with foil. You could just put them in a glass um, dish and then, you know, sprinkle on whatever. And as long as you keep turning them, they'll cook fine. Or a covered dish. Or a covered dish, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I hadn't heard anything about um, aluminum foil. Okay. All right, I think that's all of our questions that we have um, for tonight. If anybody else has anything they'd like to include in the chat, go ahead and put it in there now. Uh, Gina and Pam, thank you. We had a lot of great comments and everybody has enjoyed this uh, Q&A right. style chat. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, we did go over a little bit. It's, it's a grand, two grand, huge topics. And we don't usually do this. No. I've never done this before. So we're, yeah. And we do talk a lot. Yeah. 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 So. Well, it was fabulous. And I am going to just share a little bit about our upcoming prevention and wellness series. Um, so next month we will discuss the science of epigenetics and why your DNA is not your destiny. This will be presented by Dr. Jeffrey Jagir, who is our usual host of the series from the Center for Cancer Prevention and Wellness. Uh, don't miss out as we discuss the science behind how small actions can lead to great health outcomes or serious health consequences. And you can RSVP to this talk ahead of time by going to, whoops, the, if you look to the virtual programs tab on the Cancer Survivors Park webpage. And then I have another very fun piece of information that I'd like to talk, to share. The, oh, I'm so sorry. The Cancer Survivors Park is hosting a Rock the Lot drive-in concert series. And this will be held at the downtown airport. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the website here because it's, 
a fabulous website. Uh, this is a two night event benefiting the Cancer Survivors Park Alliance, who is our sponsor to, for our series. And um, the park is an entirely philanthropy funded community organization. So um, as I said, we'll have two performers, one on June 4th and the other on June 5th. Uh, Yacht Rock Review is kind of a 70s Americana cover band group, uh, a lot of fun, kind of playing all your favorite hits. And then Hound Mouth is a alternative indie group who is a national touring act. So either night will be a lot of fun. Um, the pricing is all listed on the website, which is rockthelotgvl.org, which we will also post in the show notes. Um, and the price is per car. So it's going to be a drive-in tailgate concert. Um, which is probably something none of us have done in, in ever. So it's kind of a new thing since COVID. Um, so we encourage you to join us. And um, other than that, we will, I just wanted to mention again, the Center for Cancer Prevention and Wellness uh, Gre Prevent Cancer Greenville Research Study um, will this is a great way to kind of assess your cancer risk and get more information on topics that we discussed tonight that's specific to you. Um, the study is free and offers a range of services to help you learn how to reduce your cancer risk or detect cancer early when it's most treatable. Um, it's open to anybody 18 years and older. The participants must speak English, but it does not need to be your English, it's not for English speakers only, you just must speak some English. Um, and I will just go through our slides here and to schedule an appointment to take part in the study, you can contact ccpw at prismahealth.org or call 864-455-CCPW. And with that, I went through that kind of quick since we've gone over tonight, but Thank you all for joining us. Um, I will stop sharing. Whoops. Okay. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I will leave you with a quick quote in the custom of all of our previous discussions. And um, here it is. Your mind believes everything you tell it. Start with, you got this. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank Melissa. You.